guys. Uh, I did a little written um, Q&A responding to a few questions in Telegram um, a couple of weeks ago. We're just trying to condense this, condense this down into a little uh, video version of that Q&A now. But if you want to participate in future Q&As, there'll be some on session in the session open group session channel. Um, you can see it in your recommended list if you go on the session application. Um, and there'll also be future ones in the Telegram as well. Um, so jump in and you can ask any question that you want and I'll try to answer as many as possible and hopefully we'll make a little video version like this as well for those who uh, weren't able to jump in the channel at the time and see the answers. Yeah, the Kim project is a pretty interesting one. Um, Originally we started talking to him because he was really interested in looking at in session and what we were doing on that side and really impressed with how we'd built this network which was quite similar to something that he had wanted to build for a while. Um, but after that we started talking about some of the projects that he was thinking about building in the Web3 space. So yeah, we're working with him on a Web3 project. Um, I'm not sure how much more I can say than that. Um, but yeah, keep your eyes peeled because we'll be announcing what's happening in the future. So yeah, I think it's important to recognize that the back end of Session is actually um, very far advanced um, from some of the other projects that we're competing with. No one really has the same sort of decentralized network that we have or the ability to onion route messages like we have using our own network. Um, so that side is the side that we've spent, you know, years developing through, you know, developing the Oxen token, developing the service node network, developing the onion routing functionality on top of that. That's where we've spent a majority of our time. Um, the session application itself, we haven't spent the majority of our time on, and we're just sort of, we're just sort of starting to reallocate our resources to move some of those people who were previously working on the core functionality of the application, the service node part of the application, for example, they're now moving into more session-related tasks. So what I think needs to happen is the session app really needs to improve its user experience. We need to have some of the things that Telegram has that brings in users, that's stuff like stickers, message reacts, um, you know, these features that might not necessarily be the most privacy enhancing features, um, but are features that increase the usability of the application. Um, and a calls is another example of um, one of those things that people really want. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be a combination of us introducing those features over the next, over the coming years, um, coming months, you know, some of them are coming way sooner. We have calls in beta already and stickers and reactions aren't too far away too. So introducing all of those features and growing up the user base, I think is, is really what's most likely to drive most of our growth. So this one is an interesting one because we've looked at various ways to try and get service node operators to operate their service nodes on different um, network providers. The main driving cost is that, um, you know, the the network providers that are cheap and easy to use tend to be located in European countries and tend to be run by the same people. So if you look at something like Hetzner, it's fairly cheap bandwidth wise um, to get a high performant node. Um, and there's other um, providers also in that European area, France, Germany, Netherlands, that are also very cheap, um, affordable, like cheap and easy to use as well. Like they have nice interfaces and they set things up for you. Um, Something that we have done recently is update the guides um, to have like kind of a section beforehand which talks about network decentralization. That we don't want all of the nodes to be in the same geographic location because, you know, if one of these data centers goes down or decides to do uh, perform some sort of malicious action, then that does affect the entire network. So we've added some um, information in the service node guide um, to help users with that. There is other approaches we could take as well. Um, for example, we could determine um, the autonomous system that an internet service provider is in like based on your service node IP address and then we could reward um, users who set up in um, autonomous systems that haven't been used before or subnets that haven't been used before um, higher than those ones that are in um, subnets with existing um, service nodes there or in, in autonomous systems with existing service nodes in there. That's something that we haven't done yet, but if 
this this problem continues to get worse, we continue to see more centralization within those main data centers, then I think it's something that we could explore. But I think taking the soft touch right now and trying to educate service node operators as to where they should run their um, service nodes um, to benefit the network, I think is an approach we want to take first. So yeah, it's an interesting one and there's several options we can take on that front, but um, we're trying to take the education part first. So the current roadmap is for LokiNet um, to be included in session before Session Pro features come out. The main reason we want to do that is because LokiNet will provide a really good base for Session to work from in terms of um, the ability to make requests to the service node network, um, the Session Open Group Server and the Session File Server. Right now we have the system called Onion Request which is essentially this single shot request. So you ask, you know, I want this piece of information, gets wrapped up in an Onion Request, goes off to the service node network and then comes back to you. But that's all done in a single request. There's no stream of information kind of going back and forth between the node. If you want more information, you have to ask in another onion request. LokiNet allows us to kind of keep a more persistent path open between um, you and a service node, which means you can stream requests back and forth way easier. Um, and we think that this is going to really help in terms of um, you know, getting messages in faster, um, getting files in faster. We can remove some of the file caps from the file server if we're able to do this, and that's one of the Session Pro features that we talk about is enabling larger file transfers. Um, so yeah, a lot of this is predicated on looking at inclusion inside of um, Session. So we're working on that first before we get to Session Pro features. Yeah, so something we were talking about quite extensively last year, and if you were following in the channels, we talked about it um, quite a bit there, was an exit node marketplace for LokiNet. Um, that's something that we were quite interested in at that point, but we decided to kind of focus a little bit more on session in the short term. Um, it's, it's an interesting concept that is now being taken um, by external developers, actually. There's a few people that are interested in developing this. Um, so we're working with them and providing them any resources that they need to continue that development of the exit node marketplace because it doesn't necessarily need our involvement. Um, it's more about providing a area where people can market their exit nodes um, to people who want to buy them and then potentially accept payments in Auxin or other cryptocurrency to get access to those exit nodes. Um, technically, all of the mo most of the infrastructure that you would need to do that is in place. So we have authentication codes for exit nodes um, that you can set up. So the only people that are using that authentication code can get access to your exit node. Um, so yeah, we've worked a little bit on it, but um, we're hoping that some of our um, ecosystem partners and, and people who are developing in the space will be able to um, push that project a bit more forward for us. Yeah, so we put the session monetization plan out about nine months ago, and that is still our existing plan for how to pump value from session back into Oxen. Um, and that will be our plan going forward as well. Um, marketing will have more to say about what particular um, pushes we'll be making over the course of the year to try and um, get that adoption happening more and more. But yeah, the session monetization plan is essentially our our biggest um, feature feedback from session to auction in terms of you know increasing the auction price. So uh, currently the way that LokiNet works is it's a client server architecture in terms of snaps. So when you access a um, snap on LokiNet, you're essentially talking to a centralized server um, through a bunch of hops in LokiNet. Um, we want to keep that model because it's the way that the internet works as well, um, is talking to centralized servers, except you're just kind of talking to centralized servers through an onion routing network in LokiNet. Um, I don't think it's a good idea for us to push too far into the decentralized kind of hosting and storage space, just because I think there's a lot of projects that do it better than that do it better than us and that would do it better than we would do if we went into that space um, really heavily. Um, so, you know, particularly mentioning projects like Arweave, which allow you to um, kind of store files permanently um, on a network. That's a really good network for this. So there's an Arweave gateway on LokiNet. Um, so if you want to put up a static site, you can put it up on Arweave and then you can access it through LokiNet. 
um, and there's some information on the, the Loki Net Wiki if you want to um, have a go at that yourself. So that kind of already offers the option to be able to decentralize, to host something in a decentralized way, but still access it through Loki Net without us having to build that whole entire infrastructure ourselves. So the reason that we've tried to focus more of our resources on open groups right now is because they are the most used part of session. Um, you know, when, when people are interacting with each other, we have over 4,000 people in our official session open group and there's lots of other community run open groups which are really um, starting to gain traction as well. And when you look at other messaging applications like Telegram, the way that they've been able to grow so successfully is by having these massive communities which people want to join and they need to download the Telegram app to do that. So that was one of the um, reasons that we've really focused development resources on open groups and especially the session open group server. Now that's not to say that LokiNet integration into session isn't important, it really is and that's going to be something that we'll be focusing on over the next couple of months. It's just that we really wanted to get open groups to a really nice state which we feel like they're getting pretty close to um, now. Um, and once that was done, then we wanted to focus on LokiNet integration, which is happening as well. Yeah, so Simon was actually back in the office um, just over the Christmas period um, a couple of months ago, um, back down in Australia. He's, pretty, he's got his hands pretty full with Chainflip right now, just especially because it is in that kind of infancy stage. Um, where they're still building the kind of core product and that was the same thing when the service node network was happening that's kind of one of the more intense periods of building a product um, so he hasn't been around too much but he, he still gets involved in the day-to-day -day discussions that we have management level discussions it's just you know he's not so much on the ground you know looking at people's computer screens and saying you know this is you know I like that or I like this it's more at the management level um, where he's involved in steering the kind of longer term direction of the company so yeah he's still here he, um, he still works with us but um, he definitely has his hands full with Chainflip as well um, and all of that kind of rolls back into the, the success long-term success of Oxen as well um, you know we still have a relationship with that company and um, you know it's beneficial for us if Chainflip does well um, just because we have that relationship with them yeah, so I think um, Session is kind of ready for um, that user base like, you know, political dissidents, um, human rights activists. It does really depend on what their threat model is and I would encourage people to understand what their threat model, their personal threat model is and assess that against what Session actually provides. Um, but I think after we had our audit um, from Quark's lab and we you know, had a third party confirm that the app, you know, um, has the security that we claim it does. I think that at that point, um, it was, you know, it's responsible to start, um, you know, kind of promoting to those types of people that this is an app that you might want to use. Um, now, as I said before, it always comes down to your threat model and exactly, you know, what you're trying to use the app for. Um, but yeah, I think Session provides a really good option for people who, um, you know, don't want to expose their IP address or don't want to sign up to a messaging application with a phone number. And um, it's a really good option for um, human rights and human rights activists and journalists all around the world. Yeah, so the main thing um, as the network grows is to, un to understand is that we don't necessarily need more nodes. We just need the same amount of nodes doing more proportional work or um, we, can have more no we can have more nodes as well doing the same amount of work, but if the nodes that we have on the existing network increase some of their requirements, so if they have more storage, if they have more bandwidth to provide to us and if their latencies are lower, then that is good for the existing network and means we'll be able to cope with new session users coming onto the platform just while maintaining the existing service node count. So it's not necessarily about, um, you know, we need this amount of service nodes to deal with this amount of session users. It's more about, um, you know, watch what each service node is required to have to be on the network. So we're always on the watch um, for how saturated the, you know, the network is. We have the foundation nodes, obviously, which we look at. Um, 
in terms of how much space they're using to store the session messages that they store and how much bandwidth they're consuming to route those messages. And if we feel that um, the network is currently underpowered for the amount of session users that we're bringing on board or the amount of local net traffic that we're bringing on board, then we would recommend um, an upgrade to the network to kind of push higher bandwidth requirements or push higher storage requirements so that the existing service nodes, the ones that aren't um, you know, powerful enough to stay on the network, they would get kicked off and replaced by new nodes. Or um, you know, if they weren't kicked off, then the service node reward would, inc or if they were um, kicked off, then the service node reward would increase to those existing nodes to be able to compensate them for those additional requirements. So it's, a, it's always a tricky balance um, with how you go on that side, but it's not necessarily that more nodes equals more users that we can serve on session or looking at, and it's something that we do monitor as well. Um, you know, we have monitored over the course of the last, you know, um, two years, I think, the service node network has been running. Yeah, so for session, um, you know, we've been pretty public about the features that we've been focusing on. Um, you know, recently, the biggest push has been towards calls, um, which we've spent a significant amount of time on, so that's video and voice calls. Um, you know, some of the smaller features that we've introduced, um, you know, message requests, which we were talking about before, ID blinding, which we're talking about, which kind of, you know, both of these kind of add some anti-spam um, functionality to session. Um, you know, we've done global search recently as well. Um, these are kind of smaller features, but the most major one would be um, calls that we're working on right now. On Lokinet, um, I think we're really focusing more on, two, we're focusing kind of on two things right now. Um, one is getting back um, client support for Mac and Windows. It's been a bit shaky over the last, you know, kind of six to nine month period. So we want to bring that back in line so that the Windows and Mac clients are really good and really stable and have a nice visual interface to interact with. And then the other thing that we really have been looking um, to get done with Lokinet is actually integration into session. And that will get a lot more users onto LokiNet, and it'll just get the the platform, um, you know, into our most used application as well, um, which kind of integrates those closer together and means that, you know, if there's any issues with LokiNet on session, that we'll have more pri more of a priority to fix that up and and, and focus on it more. Um, so yeah, those are the kind of two things that we're focusing on for those um, for look for LokiNet and session essentially. So the foundation has previously supported, um, you know, liquidity programs, um, specifically the Uniswap um, incentives program, which was trying to encourage um, people to contribute liquidity to the Uniswap pool on WOX and um, USDT on the on the WOX and USDT pair. Um, what we found there, though, was that it wasn't very efficient. We were paying out a high amount of rewards to only get a low amount of liquidity. And we weren't actually seeing that many users using that WOX and USDT pool. Um, so something that we've been more excited about recently is actually integration with Chainflip, um, and then providing some liquidity um, rewards for that Chainflip pool. And because Chainflip uses Uniswap v3 pools as well, um, the idea is that we can, with a lower amount of liquidity, we can concentrate that liquidity around the current trading price, and we can get kind of more bang for our buck or more efficiency. Um, when we provide liquidity to that pool. So that might come in the way of the foundation directly providing liquidity. I'm not a member of the foundation, so I don't know exactly what they're going to do, or it might be in, the, in terms of them providing rewards um, for people who provide liquidity to that chainflip pool. Um, so yeah, that's something that we've been working on, and obviously we're always in discussions with um, different centralized exchanges as well. Um, regarding listings. We can't talk about specific exchanges obviously, but we do talk to exchanges and we do, um, you know, it's, it's an important aspect of, of what the foundation does is, you know, um, provide liquidity for, for the coin and also to try and um, increase the markets that were available on and increase the liquidity in the existing markets too. Yeah, so I think um, over the last kind of six months, we've definitely, or maybe probably six to 12 months, we've definitely tried to allocate more resources towards Session. Um, and that's meant um, some of the Oxen Core developers like Jason have come off uh, working on stuff like Reedlink and have come to working on um, stuff like the Session Open Group server and the Session File server. 
Um, so that, from our perspective, has always just been because we think that um, growing session is the most efficient way to increase the Oxen price in the long term instead of adding features directly um, to Oxen. And that kind of comes more around this point, point of, uh, it's, a, it's a bigger point, but we think that it's very difficult to get merchant adoption of Oxen right now. And focusing on growing the session user base by providing more features to session is always going to be a little bit easier than getting people to use Oxen, whether we have Blink or ReBlink um, added. Um, we still need to encourage people to get on board, and that means solving um, you know, other issues as well, which are um, more difficult, like exchange listings or um, providing more liquidity on the markets. Really, for us, we feel like it's more efficient to um, concentrate our time on session, which has the, the higher growth potential um, of the two applications, and that's kind of what we've done um, over the kind of last six to 12 months is focus more resources, more resources, more resources, sorry, onto session, and a little bit um, less resources onto Oxen. Now, we still do have a full-time developer on Oxen, um, that's Sean, and he's been working on batching over the past um, couple of months. So it's not like we're abandoning Oxen altogether, that's not the case at all. Um, we still do spend time developing it, um, and Jason still has time to work on Wallet3 and the other stuff that we're working on there. And we will come back to Reblink as well, it's not a feature that's off the table. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the justification for why we've moved around our resources a little bit. Uh, thanks guys for listening to my uh, answers today. I think Josh will be handling the next Q&A. Obviously, you can submit some more marketing-related questions um, to him, which hopefully you can answer. Um, so yeah, we'll hand it over to Josh for the next one.